And Lord the people praise you. Lord the people praise you. Lift you up and raise you. Lift you up and raise you. Lord, you are the Holy One. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. You're the one, you're the only one. And Lord the people you love. Above you, place nobody above oh, you. You are the only one. You are the only one. You're the one. You're the only one. You're the one. You're the only one. And how may I lay hallelujah? How may I lay hallelujah? All the glory is to you. All the glory is to you. from Los Angeles and welcome to the 2021 Virtual World Missions Jubilee. Our theme for this year comes from Mark 11, beginning in verse 22. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth. If anyone says this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. So our theme this year, Mountain Moving Faith. Our goal for the weekend is quite simple, to come out of Zoom recovery, or as Tim Kernan puts it, ZR, to come out of the dullness that the pandemic has put on many of us 
and to embrace a mountain moving faith that can change the nations and change the world. Saludos cariñosos familia. Warm greetings family. I'm so excited for this 2021 World's Missions Jubilee. You know, it's not just for us in the International Christian Church, but it's also for our remnant brothers and sisters and for our dear friends. And God is moving incredibly. We are over 9,000 disciples worldwide. We have 122 churches. We're in 50 nations. It's so amazing what God is doing. And you know, last year at this time, this was an incredible miracle. My sister Carmen and her husband Martin began their journey to study the Bible and figure out what we're all about. And they joined us in the sold out movement in February of this year. I'm so grateful to God's mercy and love. You know, just a couple of days ago, we held the Crown of Thorn Council Zoom meeting where we appointed six more geographic sector leaders. You may ask if you're new, what is a geographic sector leader? It's a couple that oversees at least four churches in a geographical area of the world. We already have two awesome couples serving this capacity. Jason and Sarah Dimitri, who oversee the Dream Churches in the United States, and Blaise and Patricia Fumba, who oversee all of French-speaking Africa. But newly appointed, and, and very excitingly, Alfredo and Alejandra Anuch now oversee the Southern Cone of South America. Ricky and Colleen Chalonor oversee Southeast Asia. Mickey and Lily Nagungu oversee Central Africa. Joel and Courtney Parlour oversee the Pacific Northwest. Rajan and Debs Rajan oversee South Asia. And Luke and Brandon Speckman not only oversee South Asia, but also the Northern Sages churches in America. And so, I don't know about you, I'm excited about this weekend. To start things off, one of my dear friends, Dr. Michael Kirshner, who serves as the World Sector Leader for Administration Law, will open us up with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, th thank you that tonight we get to come before you with just gratitude in our hearts. Uh, just generosity in our hearts, Father. Just thankfulness in our hearts, God, that uh, you've really given us life. Uh, Father, that uh, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that that spirit now lives in us. Father, that we've been forgiven of our sins, Father, that uh, you've called us out of darkness into your wonderful light. Father, that you, you consider us to be uh, princes and princesses in your kingdom. You have crowned us with glory, God, that we are just grateful. And Father, that as we get ready to, 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 for the Jubilee, the mountain moving faith, God, to, to understand uh, the power of the mountain. Father, it is your kingdom, and we're part of that kingdom. We get to come before that mountain tonight. And, and Father, the, the power of faith. Father, you, you tell us that, that faith can be as small as a mustard seed, or we can have great faith, but the importance of faith, because it comes through hearing the word. And Father, we get to hear that word preached tonight through our brother Blaze. I pray that you're with him. Put on his heart the right words to move us and inspire us and convict us, God, and help us to draw closer to you. And, and Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful, thankful for Kip and Elena. Thank you that they have led us through all these years. Continue to watch over them. Continue to give them wisdom and discernment to lead all of us, God. I thank you that uh, this Jubilee is now possible because of all the great work. Thank you for Tim and, and Ron and, and, and Ryan and Brian and just Rob and just all the work that's been done that we can come together. Father, we're just grateful for these things. And Lord, that uh, we know that as we really come before you in prayer tonight, God, that uh, as we come as brothers and sisters and men and women and sons and daughters in the faith, God, that uh, you know that we want to set our hearts and our minds on things above. We want to be God focused. God, we want to give our whole heart that we can just praise you and please you in everything that we do. We love you and we pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
bring you greetings from beautiful, warm, and sunny Miami, Florida. My name is Matt Sullivan. And I'm Helen Sullivan, and we have the privilege of overseeing the work here in the Metro Miami area and also the Sages World Sector. And we're so excited today to bring you the good news from New England, the Southeastern United States, the Caribbean, and South Asia. Speaking of South Asia, in Calcutta, Roger and Yasha Green are now leading the church, and they've already had their first team baptism in Simran. In Bangalore last month, they had four baptisms despite, despite severe lockdown issues. In Chennai, they've had 42 additions from January to June despite the lockdown, but also several of these traveled three to six hours just to get baptized. That's the heart of a sold out disciple. In New Delhi, the, the church is beginning to really move again as our dear brother Raja has miraculously recovered from COVID and doing better and better. Please keep them in your prayers. In Kathmandu, an interesting story, Esther was baptized on her mother. Kamari intensely persecuted her. Kamari used to go to the second largest church in Kathmandu, but when Debsi studied the Bible with her, she came to know the truth and decided to become a disciple anyway. Amazingly, now the persecutor is a true follower of Jesus Christ. And I bring you greetings from Philadelphia, where the church was planted uh, in January, and Nick and Dale have led that church powerfully to baptize 14 people, and they've had one place membership directly from the ICOC. In Syracuse, Dave and Jill Swan have totally revived the spirit of the Syracuse church. At the beginning of this year, there were 47 disciples, and now they have 62 disciples. Also, they just had their highest Sunday attendance in the last five years. In Boston, they had 50 baptisms this year, one restoration and five place memberships in just in the first half of the year. Also, they're sending out 15 disciples to plant the Providence, Rhode Island Church, where they've already baptized six people who are waiting for the mission team to come. And in New York, they've had 60 additions in 2021. Since January, they've also been able to send out 22 people to Philadelphia, one to Syracuse, two to Boston, and two to Detroit for a total of 27 people they've sent out. And seven of those people were in the full-time ministry. They have hired seven additional full-time interns, and so they now have 11 full-time staff focused on the campus ministry. Amen. If we keep going south in Orlando, the church is forcefully advancing as they're making their way to 100 for the Lord as our dear brother Chris Klopek continues to miraculously heal up from his injury earlier this year. In Gainesville, it's been incredible to see every single Bible talk has already been fruitful this year. In Tampa, well, we now have ICCM Tampa because Jared got his master's degree. In TNT, Martin and Carmen Bentley placed membership uh, right directly from the ICOC and now they're leading and discipling the marriage ministry. In addition, they've seen 16 additions this year, and the campus ministry now numbers 22 sold-out disciples. In the Caribbean, despite COVID and the political situation, in particular in Haiti, it's amazing to see that God has already given them 61 baptisms in Haiti and 14 in the Dominican Republic as the church has continued to grow. In Cuba, speaking of the Caribbean, Amazingly, a Church of Christ preacher reached out to Kip because he wanted revival. He saw what was happening and he wanted things to turn. So currently, Jared McGee and I are studying the Bible with the leaders and prayerfully they'll be baptized very soon and we will have a remnant group in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Please keep that in your prayers. Finally, in Miami, we're so fired up to welcome all of you September 2nd to the 5th, 2021 to our movement's first ever International Campus Leadership Seminar entitled Stand on the Heights, taken from Psalm 18. This will be an historic event as a movement because we're more focused than ever on having powerful campus ministries around the world. It's going to be an incredible time. We have some of the top leaders from around the movement that will be preaching. We'll have disciples from all over the world right here in Miami. Please come and join us. Stay tuned as registration information comes out very soon. We love, we love you, you from, from Miami. Miami. Greetings, we bring you good news from the Middle East. We just returned from a trip to Dubai, and what an incredible trip it was. 
In Ephesians 3.20, the Bible reads that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And he has certainly done that. Here to give us some great news from the women's ministry is my dear wife, Geraldine. Greetings y saludos del Medio Oriente. We had an amazing time in Dubai and I would like to, to take the time to lift up Chandra Batayota who is leading the church in the interim as we go through this transition. She's also our administrator and she's just, just doing an amazing job on working on and keeping things together. I also want to lift up Anna Aviles, who's originally from LA. For one year, she prayed that God would allow her to meet a Latina and study the Bible with her and baptize her. Luckily, God answered her prayer, and a few days ago, Carla from Colombia was baptized and now is your sister in Christ. I also want to take the time to lift up all the amazing Southwest women who work so hard and so diligently and have pulled together and because of it, we have added many, many amazing women. And also the women in San Diego who have pulled together and have worked diligently and have added many amazing women and God continues to grow our number. You know, I don't know how I can top any of that, honey. Uh, but the men are doing equally as well. Our brother Israel, who just became a Christian a, a, a little bit less than a year ago, is the interim leader to the Dubai church at this time. He's doing an amazing job. In spite of getting COVID, his spirit is lifted high as he has this responsibility. He's very grateful for it. I want to lift up a couple things right here. One is the Southwest. I'm so proud of each and every one of the church leaders who have worked tirelessly to instill the culture of joy, zeal, and fruitfulness. And yes, they have been doing that all over the place. We are growing more and more. Let me turn my attention to San Diego right here. Uh, truly inspired by this group of disciples. Just a little bit more than a year ago, or about a year ago, we came here, there were 14 disciples. And honestly, they were a little challenged in their faith. But let me tell you, their faith grew and here we are a year later, and there's 72 fired up, sold out disciples here in San Diego. The leaders here have been magnificent. They've been so hard working. I mean, G and I could never ask for a better group of folks to work with. We're so proud, we have four regions, actually a fifth one. We have one down in Tijuana, Mexico. God is just doing immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. We're so fired up, we're so grateful to the Kings and those that have helped us, the Kirshners, uh, to help us just to get this work going and to keep it going strong. Thank you for letting us share. We're so grateful to be here, to be part of the kingdom, and to be able to share with you today. We love you and God bless. And remember, love God and love people. Greetings from the Tribe World Sector. It is incredible to be here at the Virtual World Missions Jubilee. This is my lovely wife, Leanne, and my name is Tim. And uh, we are gonna share good news uh, from the Hawaiian Geographic Sector, from uh, Los Angeles, from the Dream Geographic Sector, and from the Southeast Asia Geographic Sector. My lovely wife is gonna share first about the Hawaiian Supplemental Mission Team. Well, greetings from the No Church Left Behind Supplemental Mission Team to the Hawaiian Islands. And uh, first and foremost, just special uh, thank you to Tony and Therese Antelon. Um, Tony and Therese are our Congregational Shepherds here in LA, and as you know, they are World Sector Shepherds. And they went to Hawaii for a whole month just to minister to the church, the church and the disciples there. And their hard work, they poured their, their hearts out, their lives out, so much so that they earned the nickname, the grandparents of the Hawaiian Islands. And so Tony and Therese, thank you so much for all of your hard work and how you really love the disciples so deeply to give your hearts to them and really pour out all of your, your love for God and your, your incredible experience to them. So thank you so much, we love you. Secondly, of course, is Mike and Brittany Underhill, who along with Chris and Mariah Lastra, 
took eight other sold out disciples to land in Honolulu, where the church went from 57 to now 70 disciples as the mission team, the supplemental mission team and the church there became one. And it's so amazing what's happened so far. They are on fire there in Honolulu and Hilo and Kona. But of special note, there's a, a, amazing good news in the campus ministry as Maurice Johnson and Haley Hasselon, who lead the campus there at UH of Manoa, they had a record-breaking 70 visitors in attendance. So they had 62 non-Christian visitors along with the disciples there on campus and had an incredible Bible discussion. Please continue to pray for U of H at Monoa that they will continue to have amazing fruit and that God will work powerfully. Love you. Amen. And now I want to give you bring, bring you good news from the City of Angels Church. Um, this year has been incredible uh, with a goal of 1.16 million, $1,160,000 $1, uh, as our goal for missions. The City of Angels Church, the, the generous hearts of the disciples, poured out $1,250,000, uh, $1, which is just incredible. Um, so grateful, the amazing hearts. On top of that, um, God has also sent out 57 leaders and strong disciples from the City of Angels Church, including six evangelist and women's ministry leader couples. Among them, um, uh, Richie and Elizabeth McDonald, who uh, did an incredible job leading the West Region and are now leading the Minneapolis uh, International Christian Church. Chris and Mariah Lastra, who now lead the campus ministry in Honolulu. The Gonzaleses, Victor and Sonia, who are now leading the Albuquerque International Christian Church. Um, Jay and Alicia Kazi, who went out to lead the mighty St. Louis mission team. The Fedelikas, who are now the right-hand couple up in Portland. And the Kellys, who came into LA for about three and a half months for training and have gone back to lead the mighty Hilo Church. It is amazing to see what God is doing in the City of Angels Church. In other exciting news, 13 were sent out on the mission team to Baguio City, which was led by Mark and Micah Carbonell, who are so special to us here in LA, of course, because they went out on the mission team originally to Manila. And so it's so amazing to see how much they've grown under Ricky and Colleen's discipleship and now going out to lead the church in Baguio City. And it's really amazing. Their first inaugural service had 156 in attendance. They've so far had five baptisms. And a special note, of course, which is special to Mark's heart, was his cousin attended the inaugural service and now is your brother in Christ. Amen. And finally, uh, we bring you good news from the Dream Geographic sector, valiantly led by Jason and Sarah Dimitri, who we love so much. In particular, I really want to lift up the Chavezes, the leaders of the Dallas International Christian Church. Incredibly, in one year, that church has grown from 66 to 120, 100% growth in one year, which is totally amazing. Also, uh, very special to our hearts, Daniela, Jason and Daniela Woody from the um, <clears throat> Houston Church, are going to be moving to Denver with 13 strong disciples as another No Church Left Behind initiative. So we're super excited to see all the amazing things happening in Texas. Also so excited about the incredible things happening in San Francisco. You know, five years ago, Jason and Sarah set up the Canaan Project, which was to plant 10 regions across the San Francisco Bay. As of this last weekend, they have now planted their eighth region of the mighty San Francisco Bay International Christian Church. And that region is the Santa Cruz region led by Christian and Devin Enos, who we're so proud of. You know, it's so amazing to see all the things that God is doing. The tribe is so fired up to be part of this movement, to give to the movement, to support the movement and to do whatever we can to be the humble servants that God wants us to be. We love you very much. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the good news from the tribe.
Good evening, my name is Joe Willis, my beautiful wife Kerry Willis. We're going to share you the good news from the Austral China world sector. I want to bring you great news from our church in Crouching Tiger One. It has been an amazing year up there for them with dating couples and recently an incredible engagement. I really want to highlight one of our incredible sisters up there, Themis. She was our first Chinese convert here in Sydney. She found us on the internet back in 2014. She went on the mission team to Hong Kong and has been an incredibly faithful disciple for seven years, although she had not dated or gone into the ministry, which was her dream. This year, however, has been amazing for her. She's gone into the ministry. She started dating Chi, our leader in Crouching Tiger One, and is now engaged and by the end of this year will be leading the church with him. Great, I want to share about Crouch and Tiger 2. Despite them not being able to evangelize, in the last two years they've uh, one off tripling and they've had some amazing converts. One lady uh, was actually by a tree. The disciples had a Bible discussion on the grass. A cat jumped out of the tree. This girl jumped, was scared of the cat, jumped into the Bible discussion and went, what is this? They started studying the Bible with her and she was baptized this year. Incredible. Um, I really want to bring you great news from Sydney. Despite the universities being closed from due to COVID-19, 80% of our baptisms this year have been from our campus ministry. And in Samoa, it continues to be an example of growth and a shining light of the islands. Having locals on staff, family baptisms, and an extraordinary push services of up to 175 people for 30 disciples. Last but not least, I want to share about Auckland, a real personal victory. Ian and Margot Clegg were the uh, couple that helped us set up the Sydney church, helped us keep faithful in Brisbane, and uh, they have not only helped us start the church in Sydney, when it helped start the church in Auckland. Their oldest daughter, Isabel, was baptised a couple of years ago, but this year their youngest child, Hannah, was baptised. And I remember playing Wii with Hannah when she was like five years old. So I just want to, you know, again, lift them up for their faithfulness, and just it's so great to see their family come to the Lord. Thank you so much for listening to us. Bye. Good evening, family. My name is Michael Williamson. This is my incredible wife, Michelle. We bring you good news from the European world sector. Let me tell you something. The first piece of good news is the Scotland International Christian Church. We're planting our flag. Colby and Rebecca are planting that church literally in the next couple of months. Amen. Yes, we are excited for the grace planting the Edinburgh International Christian Church at the European Missions Conference, which will be held this year in Paris. I am so proud of Anthony and Cassidy who have done an incredible work there in Paris. They have not only built up the campus ministry, raised their special missions, but have put on two incredible French nationals, Yasmine and Joan. Yasmine is a very special young lady. She is a French uh, medical student that actually gave up her dream for medicine to go into the full-time ministry this month. We are so proud of Yasmin and her stand, which has brought in a lot of persecution. But in spite of that, she is shining bright for Jesus. You know, it's been incredible to take a stand in the midst of controversy. We wrote a letter to the government demanding that, hey, we get a chance to meet. And guess what happened? God worked on our behalf. We've been meeting over throughout the entire coronavirus and God has really moved powerfully. The other thing that's good news is that all the churches have raised their missions contribution. Paris is self-supporting. They blew out their missions. London is blowing it out year after year after year. Scotland, or not Scotland yet, but uh, Amsterdam is blowing out their missions and that church has grown by 42% and several people want to go into full-time ministry, including a young man who wants to plant Spain right there. So God is moving right there and raising the funds and we're excited about that because that gives us the seed money to plant Dublin, Ireland 2022. Yes, and finally, I'm really, really proud of not only my husband, but 12 other master's students, including our friend Nick Bordieri, who will be graduating at this Jubilee with their master's degree in ICCM. 
finally, we will also be having 16 bachelor's ICCM students from London who will also be getting their bachelor's degrees at the EMC in October. And lastly, it's history for us, the first English couple, not only that gets raised on up, but that gets appointed as women's ministry leader and evangelist, we will be appointing Luke and Frankie Snow. We love you guys. We'll see you at the, at the EMC, yes. and to God be all the glory. Greetings, everyone, from the beautiful, windy city of Chicago. My name is John Causey. And I'm Emma Causey. And we bring you good news from the PAC World Sector. I'll let my wife Emma share first. Yes. The women's ministry is on fire for God. At the beginning of the year, we had the vision to see many women baptized, God appoint women's ministry leaders, and also see women graduate from the ICCM Master's Program. God answered our prayers. At the beginning of the year, with Broken and Beautiful as our theme for Women's Day, we saw over 30 women be baptized. The sisters got behind the title. They got behind the heart of being broken and made beautiful through Christ. And not only that, just this past weekend, we saw Taylor Gardner be appointed as a women's ministry leader. I am so proud of my daughter. And then we looked back over the year and we've seen over three women graduate from ICCM with their master's degree. We celebrate Debbie Lamone. We celebrate Validia uh, Castillo. We celebrate Alessia Pablanco. We love you in the women's ministry. God is doing and will continue to do amazing things. Wow, that's so exciting in the women's ministry. Truly this year in Mount Moving Faith, which is our kingdom theme, has been exciting for us in the past. We began this year with our Northern America Missions Conference with the title theme, I Believe. And we gathered over 831 attendees from all over the Midwest and Canada. God blessed our conference in an incredible way to kick off our year. You know, excitingly as well in the pack, we set a mountain moving growth goal. You know, with 631 disciples, it was our vision and our dream to grow to 831 disciples. That would be an increase of 200 disciples in the pack. Well, excitingly, already this year, God has blessed us with over 110 additions as we now stand over 740 disciples in the PAC world sector. But most excitingly of all to us in the PAC are our three Operation Eagle church plantings. We're not only gonna plant one Operation Eagle church, but three. We're going this year to St. Louis, Missouri. We're going to Detroit, Michigan. We're going to Boise, Idaho all this summer planting these churches. You know, most excitingly to us as well is the fact that we have a baby church planting another church. The mighty Indianapolis church which just started two years ago with 15 disciples grew to over 60 disciples. And now 18 of those 60 disciples along with 10 disciples from Chicago will go to form the new Detroit, Michigan mission team. We're excited for Jeremiah and Julie Clark and their incredible vision for Detroit. Pray for us in the pack and to God be all the glory. Hello everybody, my name is Oleg and this is my wife Yelena. We want to share good news from Eurasia. Of course, for us, highlights was conference in May because as disciples, we make decision in this conference, put out all masks and be 100% on all our services together, worshiping God. And of course, we got the challenge uh, because Keep My King and Elena visit our conference and give us challenge to fastings few times to focus and do whatever it's take to bring maximum visitors on Sunday uh, for our uh, Thursday day. Uh, so for all fruit of this service, my wife will share with you guys. 
it was so great to be together on our conference in May and to have 30 people from around the world with us. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, after all our prayers, after all fasting, after all teaching about love, love of Christ, love to each other, we believe that we can do our service of record. So we decided to uh, gather all disciples on the ship for our birthday service. We invited uh, visitors as crazy. So on our uh, birthday service on the ship, we saw 254 people. It's the most uh, uh, service of our history, Kiev Church. So it was so great to see many, many visitors who studied the Bible during our two hours trip. On the first floor, every table had to study the Bible. I personally studied the Bible with Elena. Uh, she was invited by Oleg a few months ago to our church. And Elena, she baptized last Sunday. And on the second floor, also every table had to study the Bible. Keep Makin and Elena, they had conversation with Vasily. Vasily was invited by our, our campus students two years ago. And uh, he studied the Bible with Luca. He studied the Bible with Vlad. And then he didn't uh, went through county coast because he refused to love people of color. But after two years, through all prayer, uh, after he saw how we love each other and we're still together, he decided, after conversation with Kip, he decided to be baptized. And last Sunday, he also was baptized in Christ. Now he is our brother who decided to love everyone as Christ. And uh, this year in Kiev Church, we had 28 editions. All glory be to God. Also, I'm so proud of Rizu and Sasha Devitadze, who made the decision to uh, lead the Moscow. They just started leading this year, and uh, Sasha Devitadze is a great example. She baptized not only her sisters in the past and her mom, but uh, a few months ago she baptized her sister Nastya. Uh, she said the Bible and she's uh, now our disciples. Great news also about my close friend from past years when we was young disciples who was working uh, the ch for church for uh, leading IMS sector in Moscow. His name is Sergei Anohin. He just started full-time work for Moscow in our movement. Uh, and he also not only great baptizer and great amazing preacher he did all translation uh, speaking uh, work with JNN but he started to do on professional level a JNN uh, for Russian speaking country uh, every month because he was working for Pro Studio TV uh, station on the past now he's serving to God with his talent making JNN to glorify God Thank you so much. Pray, pray uh, for us in Eurasia. Love you so much. Greetings from Latin America. We're so excited to see what God has been doing in this part of the world. Uh, thank you so much, first of all for all the special contributions that the U.S. churches are doing and have done. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts because we know that many souls are being saved because of it. I want to start uh, the good news by saying that now we have six new master's ICCN degrees in our world sector. It's amazing. Uh, Vinny and Bia Rodriguez, they both got their master's. Uh, Renato Tria has his master's, which that means that they're in Sao Paulo. That means that they can continue having ICC in Sao Paulo because Linda and I moved to Mexico City. So that, that's incredible. Also, uh, 
Alfredo Anuj got his master's degree, and because of that, we have ICCM Santiago. Also, uh, Cayo Lopez got his ICCM degree, uh, his master's, and now we have ICCM Rio de Janeiro. Amen? Uh, God is moving powerfully, and let's not forget, Nick Bordieri is also getting his master's degree, so we're so happy to have him here in uh, Mexico. We're also so excited and so happy, so proud of all of the churches in South America. And especially, we have four churches that are completely run by national national leadership, which is Vinny and Villa in Sao Paulo, um, Brazil, Cayo and Carol in Rio, and also um, Luis and Malu in Cantinas, those are the Brazilian churches. And then also in Santiago, Chile, Alfredo and Alejandra Anuj. They are all a national leadership. Yeah, that, that's that's just amazing what God has done. And also I have personal good news, which is amazing, is that in the last uh, calendar year, uh, my mother and my father were baptized. And my father, you know, passed away, but he's awaiting for us in heaven. And also my son, Felipe, 16 years old, was baptized. We're so happy and so grateful for all the blessings God has given uh, the world sector and us personally. And we are especially grateful for Nick and Denise who have moved here to Mexico City and are making yes. uh, Mexico City as the home base for Mercy Worldwide. Another piece of good news is that uh, we have a new running group in Caracas, Venezuela. So we're excited what God is doing there. Uh, all the churches are growing, people are excited. And I know, God, we're going to live to see the day where the world's going to be evangelized with Latin America as well. Thank you so very much. Hi family, my name is Dr. Andrew Smelly. This is my beautiful wife, Patrick, and we bring you greetings from the Africanus World Sector. We stand in awe of how God is moving throughout the motherland of Africa and the mid-Atlantic U.S. despite the challenges of COVID, as we now have a presence in 15 African nations through eight established churches and 13 remnant groups that are waiting to be planted. We're also encouraged by the recent arrival of Ron and Tracy Harding in Washington, D.C., as plans are being made to plant Dover, Delaware by the end of this year. Please pray for us as our plan to evangelize the African nations through Operation Lionheart and the Mid-Atlantic U.S. through Operation Freedom. Despite persecution and immigration challenges, we have witnessed three church plantings in our world sector over the past year. Bujumbura, Burundi in November 2020, Yaoundé, Cameroon in June 2021, and Brazzaville, Congo on August 1st. And in June of this year, the Lord blessed our four French Africa churches with 61 baptisms and four restorations to God be the glory. You know, in Johannesburg, we're going to be celebrating our second anniversary. It's just so amazing to yes. think that we've been there that long. You know, we arrived in Johannesburg in 2019 with a mission team of 11. And in two years, with a handful of remnant disciples that were there, we have tripled our membership, you know, and also we've had the honor of adding 11 precious souls in other countries through the efforts of the disciples in Johannesburg. You know, we've also seen the restoration of some incredible disciples from the ICOC. You know, we've had, God has blessed our humble efforts despite tough restrictions because of COVID-19 that has stopped us from meeting in person since March of 2020. You know, recently two dear brothers have been restored from our former fellowship. The first one is Uncle Patrick Tinta Chona. He is the son of the former vice president of Zambia. And also his best friend, Uncle Charlie Mwenya mm -hmm. was, rest, was restored. And you know, he uh, used to oversee the work, the work for Hope Worldwide right. uh, in our former fellowship. You know, through these restorations, God allowed us to see the 50th nation in our movement of 
churches with disciples Amen. in it. Amen. You know, at our Johannesburg Women's Day entitled, entitled Worthy yes. in 2020, um, God did amazing, amazing things. But the 20 sisters that were in the church at the time, God allowed us to have over 500 visitors. It was an incredible time. And you know, we also had saw the baptism of an incredible sister. And our guest speaker was none other than Sonia Kotek, who is a native South African. God is doing amazing things. Come on. The Lord continues to move as the Lego Church just recently celebrated their fifth anniversary and is preparing to send out the Accra Ghana Church in 2023. The Joburg Church is looking forward to sending out Kampala, Uganda at our next African Missions Conference in June 2022. And in Washington, D.C., the Lord has blessed the new leadership of Ron and Tracy Harding as the church had a historic day of additions as five were restored to their fellowship, two place membership, and another two were baptized at their Harvest Sunday in July. This was incredible because that number, that nine additions, was the highest that DC has ever had, including the restoration of our former ministry couple and dear friends, Steve and Kitty Ranga. To God be all the glory. Family, thank you for your prayers, your love, and your financial support to see the motherland, one for the glory of God. We love you. singing go and make disciples well he said he said to go to every nation well, he said he said to tell everyone he said he said to make them true disciples and then and then the job will get jesus done. said go, go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them Hello, family. What an incredible privilege today to be able to come together as the modern day movement of God to have our World Mission Jubilee. I'm so thankful. My name is Blaise Fumba with my beautiful wife, Patricia. We have the privilege of leading the French speaking churches in Africa under the smellies of our great and close friends. Uh, thanks so much to God and to keep for allowing me today to share my heart. Uh, it's an incredible privilege. So uh, we're just so thankful to be alive today as we come together as a movement to absolutely, you know, rekindle our passion for world evangelism. And uh, today I have the privilege of preaching 
about the topic. My topic today is the rock that filled the earth. The rock that filled the earth. And before we start, let's bow down our heads and pray a little bit again. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you, Father, for this life-changing event, the War Mission Jubilee, where you're gathering your entire movement, the modern-day movement of God, so that we can learn from you, we can instruct one another, we can grow together, Father, in our love for you and in our passion to win the souls all around the world. We are so thankful for your presence today, Father. Let your Holy Spirit use me powerfully, just, Father, to glorify your name and to get us ready, Father, to win more nations for your name. Father, I pray for every single preacher that's going to be used by you, Father, during this time, this weekend, to change the world. I pray for your presence to be among us. I pray for your Holy Spirit to lead us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The rock that filled the earth. Let's go to Daniel chapter 2. That's the scripture I'm going to use to get into my sermon today. Daniel chapter 2. We're going to read from verse 34 to 35. And then we're going to read also from 44 to 45. Okay? So let's read in our Bible right now. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on the feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. And then verse 44 to 45, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. And church, this is an incredible scripture. We are here around the year 550 BC and about 30 years into the exile of the Jewish people in Babylon. Daniel, one of the captives with his three friends and many other Jewish, young Jewish people, they have been taken captive to Babylon from the year 605 BC to the year 586 BC in three successive waves. Only Daniel, among the Babylonian wise men, is able to tell King Nebuchadnezzar his dream and the corresponding interpretation. Because the king has dreamed something so terrible, so, so dreadful, that no wise man in Babylon could interpret it but Daniel. God was then revealing to the king the succession of human kingdoms until the establishment of God's kingdom under the Roman Empire. And you see people... Uh, Try different theories about what, what does the rock signify? What was the meaning of the mountain? But you, don't, you interpret the Bible with the Bible itself. You don't try to put your own idea in there and try to make look, look at just the way you think. You just got to make sure you use the Bible to make meaning to the verses that you don't understand. So verse 35b tells us what is the nature of the stone, of that, of that rock that became a huge mountain and filled the earth. Verse 35b, the second part says, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay, so it was this rock that destroyed the human kingdoms without a man's intervention and became a huge mountain would fill the earth. And normally in the scriptures, mountains can refer to kingdoms as well. And as we can see in verse 44 and 45, the interpretation, the correct interpretation is, in the time of those kings, that's what Daniel is saying, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Now will it be left to another people, and that kingdom will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. But it will serve in jail forever. This is the meaning of the vision. So the rock over here that's cut out of a mountain is a kingdom. And that rock is going to destroy the statue that represents all human kingdoms. So the kingdom of God is going to be the greatest kingdom, the huge mountains that's going to fill the earth by its impact. So church, we know and if you fast forward five centuries into time, the kingdom of God started in Jerusalem at Pentecost, AD 30. That was the kingdom of God. The rock cut out of the mountain only by, by God's dealing, dealing. And the kingdom started at Pentecost, and that day 3,000 people were baptized. And from that moment, the Holy Spirit used the first century disciples to evangelize all nations in their generation. And let me tell you this. 
this fecal stone that looks like a small rock was actually the beginning of a revolution. It was the beginning of something that mankind have never seen before. It was actually the fulfillment of the prophecy of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. The seed of the woman will crush the head of the devil. The mankind will have a chance to be redeemed with God and every single human being will have a chance to have his sin forgiven, to be born again and to be part of God's kingdom. So we see over here that it was not by might, it was not by power. The kingdom grew from Jerusalem to Rome and filled the earth, not by might, not by power, but by the spirit of the living God. Isn't that amazing right there? And Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 already saw that, you know, 400 years before that. So the secret of this great impact of the kingdom in only about 30 years, they went from Jerusalem to the end of the earth without any camera, without any television, without any TV, nothing, just with the Holy Spirit. And the secret, their secret is encapsulated in what Paul says to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 from 4 to 6. Let's read together, church. So Paul talks to the Thessalonians explaining to them the reason why they're having so much impact as disciples. He goes, for you know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with what? With power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. So Paul is using the Thessalonian church as an example of a church that is expanding so quickly, so powerfully. Now he tells them what he sees as the secret of their growth, which will be the secret of the growth of the entire kingdom in the first century. He goes, three things that he mentions over here. He goes, the gospel came to you with what? Not only with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit. That's the number one factor. The kingdom is only going to grow through the power of the Holy Spirit. Number two, he goes, the gospel came to you and flourished with deep conviction. And then lastly, he goes, you became imitators of us. So there are three things that I want to mention today. That if we stick to those three things, just like the first century disciples did, we're going to have the chance and the privilege to see the kingdom, the modern day kingdom in the 21st century, grow as much as it did in the first century. The little stone, the little rock will become a mountain and then will fill the entire earth in our generation. If only we imitate these three things from the first century church. Are you fired up this morning? So I have three simple points this morning, this afternoon. Number one. Fill with the spirit or full of yourself. Number two, grow deep convictions or run in vain. And then lastly, decide to imitate or be disqualified. So let's start with point number one. Fill with the Holy Spirit or full of yourself. In Jesus' days on earth, could you imagine the apostles doing ministry with no relationship with Jesus? No, no one can even think about that. Right? That's insane. That's how it feels when we do ministry with no relationship with the Holy Spirit. Blaze, what are you talking about? Well, most of the times, we don't even mention his name for fear of looking religious. So we spend all our time refuting false doctrine about the Holy Spirit, and we should. But you don't throw the dirty water away with the baby inside. So there's a false doctrine about the Holy Spirit and there's a right doctrine that the church should be preaching and experiencing every day with the Holy Spirit. So let's see how important is the Holy Spirit in the growth of the kingdom in the first century church. In John 14, we're going to read verse 16 and verse 18. And then we see what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. He goes, I was about to die on a cross and be taken back to heaven from his disciples. He's spending these last days with them, and then he says this. And I, I'm going to ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. You see, the key words over here in, this, in what Jesus is saying is another advocate. I will give you another paraclete in Greek, which means advocate counselor or helper but he said another one that means there's a previous one that they already had who was the first advocate with the disciples 
Jesus himself. But you see, Jesus was the helper, the counselor, and he was there with them, the comforter. And then he was going to go back to heaven, and he's promising to send them somebody just like him, another advocate, the Holy Spirit. It's important to understand that. So Jesus is the first advocate, and the Holy Spirit is the second one. So the same way you cannot imagine the apostles doing the ministry without Jesus, the advocate, is the same way you shouldn't imagine yourself today doing the ministry without the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't do the ministry of the Holy Spirit, then you have no advocate, you have no counselor, and you have no helper. That's the point right here. So when Jesus himself left this earth, the Holy Spirit became the new advocate and counselor for the apostles and to the newborn church. And he is still the advocate until the coming of the Lord. You see the contrast right here? Let me show you something about the importance of the Holy Spirit in the, in the moment we're living right now, okay, from the first century until Jesus come back. In the book of, um, Jesus is mentioned in all the four Gospels together. Jesus is mentioned over 900 times in the four Gospels. And the Holy Spirit is only mentioned about 90 times. What does that tell you? When Jesus was present in the flesh, he was doing almost everything with his disciples, showing them how to do everything. They had to follow his lead everywhere. But he was kind of stuck in the body. But you see Jesus being mentioned about 900 times. Why the Holy Spirit is only mentioned 90 times. Now, let's switch to the book of Acts after Jesus ascended back to heaven. Okay? The Holy Spirit is mentioned about 60, 56 times in the book of Acts. Do you know how many times Jesus is mentioned? Jesus appears in the book of Acts. Well, there are about three appearances of Jesus in the book of Acts. To Paul, twice. To Ananias, that he used to convert Paul. And then to Stephen, even though he didn't say anything. But we see Jesus in the book of Acts about four times. But the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts is showing up about 56 times. Telling you that the second advocate has replaced the first one. The Holy Spirit is the leader of the kingdom. The book of Acts is not a book of Acts of the Apostles, as we presume most of the time. It's the book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit, walking through the Apostles and the first century church. Does that fire you up? So what is the purpose of this new advocate in the life of the church, in the life of the kingdom? To help us, that's what the Bible says, to help us, Jesus said, to empower us to do God's will. Make disciples in all, in all nations, in our generation, and to be with us forever. So ignoring the Holy Spirit is dep depriving ourselves of his help. He needs to be with us forever. And not just from time to time. And Jesus says that clearly in John 14 verse 26. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. And will remind you everything I have said to you. So who is our teacher today? It's the Holy Spirit. What reminds us of what we have learned from Jesus? The Holy Spirit. Now, how can you ignore your teacher and still excel in classes? It's not possible. So, remember, the church couldn't start, the kingdom couldn't start until the Holy Spirit comes down on the apostles and the first disciples. Jesus clearly told them to wait. And they waited for 10 days in the room. They did not start preaching without having the power of the Holy Spirit. So, church, the kingdom of God expands from Pentecost until the end of the book of Acts. By the year 62, you were going to see the mark of the Holy Spirit all over the place. Filling them, correcting them, directing them, leading them in evangelism, showing them how to do things, and uh, appointing minister, and sending them on a mission field. The Holy Spirit is everywhere in the book of Acts. And the Holy Spirit, it was everywhere in the first century church. Question, is the Holy Spirit as present in the kingdom today as he was in the first century church. If not, we have to ask ourselves the questions today. Are we trying to evangelize all nations with our own strength? Or are we relying on the Holy Spirit to do the job? Can a man do what only the Holy Spirit can do through him? So if we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, will we also have the chance to evangelize the world in our generations? There's no doubt about that. Because the same Holy Spirit, the same omnipotent power, the power of the Holy Spirit is still available to the 21st century church to enable us to live a holy life, a fruitful life, and to break down all barriers so that the gospel of Jesus will be proclaimed all across the world. You see, even Jesus in the flesh was empowered by the Holy Spirit. He couldn't do it by himself. 
See in Luke chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led in the Spirit in the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. See, he was full of the Holy Spirit. And then he overcame the devil, not by the power of his flesh, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you see verse 18 and 19 of the same chapter 4. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, he said, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom from the, for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So we see that Jesus himself was empowered by the Holy Spirit in order to achieve his mission. So if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit to overcome the devil, how much more do you and I need the Holy Spirit to plant churches? I got convicted about this study myself. Because for so many years, I used to do things just by myself, using my talent, my abilities. I was not praying that much, not relying so much on the Holy Spirit, and trying to use my experience and all the skills and the techniques that I know that I've seen other people use in the ministry. But let me tell you this. I got so frustrated at one point, I wanted to quit the ministry. Because it was too much for me. It was too much that my shoulders could bear. So I remember crying to God in a prayer and begging God to show me what was wrong. And I started reading my Bible all over again. And I found out in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit was everywhere. Every time Peter did a great sermon, it was Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Every time there was a great impact somewhere, it was Paul filled with the Holy Spirit. Then I asked myself, Blaze, what was the last time you were filled with the Holy Spirit while doing the ministry? You see, Saving souls is a supernatural job. And we cannot do that with natural means. We're living in a self-reliant society and generation where we think we could just do things by ourselves. It's impossible to carry the kingdom on your back and fill the earth. The kingdom is going to crush you. If you try to do that in your own strength, you're going to be burned out. You're going to be so disillusioned that you're going to quit the ministry and probably fall away from God. See, we are not designed to do this by ourselves, guys. It's time to imitate the heart of the first century church. It's time to renew our connection with the Holy Spirit today. You see, sometimes even in our vocabulary, we are so afraid of saying, the Holy Spirit said this to me. Even though he doesn't speak to us in a very audible form, it's not like uh, having a conversation with a friend. But you feel the, the Holy Spirit telling you something. But what we do to try to stay, you know, spiritual, we go, hey, something was telling me yesterday. Don't mess up with this temptation. Something was telling me. I got convicted. And I'm going to ask you this question. Are you so embarrassed to say the name of the Holy Spirit was telling you something? And are you going to call the Holy Spirit something? It's like saying, Jesus is like hearing Peter saying, hey, you know what? Yesterday, something was telling me that I'm going to betray him three times. Something? No, Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is not a thing. It's not a power. It's a person. He has a personality. He speaks. He can be grieved. He can be resisted. He's the leader of the church. You should have this type of connection with him that you're not afraid of saying what the Holy Spirit is putting on your heart. Of course, we don't want to be so religious that, you know, whatever you want to eat something, you go, the Holy Spirit told me to eat barbecue, to eat that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about that true relationship with the Spirit of Christ that leads us in a church. Today is the time to admit that without the Holy Spirit, we cannot evangelize all nations. It's out of reach. It's time to be humble enough to go down on our knees and to start praying specifically for us and our churches to be filled with the Holy Spirit. To, to start learning about the seven characteristics of the Holy Spirit. Spirit of understanding, spirit of knowledge, spirit of wisdom, spirit of the fear of God, spirit of might, I mean spirit of counsel. He has so many attributes that he wants to give us so that we can be successful in doing the job. Church, the Spirit converts us when we get baptized. He's the one that helps us to become disciples. He redeems us. He sanctifies us. He includes us in Christ. The Holy Spirit makes us the temple of the living God. The Holy Spirit transforms us from glory to glory. The Holy Spirit empowers us to share our faith. Just like Philip going to the Ethiopian Enoch. That was the Holy Spirit leading him to go there. You see, when you evangelize, it's not just you doing the job. It's the Holy Spirit leading you to that person. We have to acknowledge who is behind the curtain. 
empowering us so that we don't take the glory for ourselves when we baptize somebody, when we accomplish something. You don't have to say, oh, I was so man, fired up. I did this, I did this. No, we are just used by the Holy Spirit because he's the one doing all this through us. Are you fired up? He even sent people on the mission field in Acts chapter 13, verse 2 and 3. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called, it, I have called them. You see that? The Holy Spirit is telling the disciples who are praying to set apart Barnabas and Paul for missions. So when God is calling you to go on a mission field in Mexico, in Africa, it's not a man calling you. It's the Holy Spirit setting you apart. You were born for this. When you're being appointed an evangelist, it's not a man doing it. The man is the vessel you're seeing. But behind the scene, you've been chosen by the Holy Spirit to be who you are today. To be in a full-time ministry. To be a shepherd. To be the deacon. To, be, to do this. All these are the dealings of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that the Holy Spirit closes and opens doors for mission works? Like he directs the church so much that he tells us what to go, where to go and not where, uh, and where not to go. Look at this example in Acts chapter 16 from 6 to 8. Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galicia having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mesia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mesia and went down to trust. You see how he directs the, the missionary trip? Paul is trying to go, and Paul was a forceful man. He was a man of character. He's trying to go in Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus goes, no, you can't go there. I don't think he heard the voice of the Spirit directly. Maybe, maybe not. But the Spirit will close doors. And sometimes when the Spirit is closing doors in front of us, we try to force ourselves into the doors. We pray so much to go where God doesn't want us to go. We just got to be humble and surrender to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You might say today, we're going to Hong Kong, but the Holy Spirit might want you to go to Taiwan. Of course, he closes the door over here, but he opens all the doors over here. It's time for us to rely on the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And I promise you, when we do that, we're going to bear much more fruit. We're going to do things like Peter preaching, filled with the Holy Spirit. In one day, they baptized 3,000 people. When was the last time we baptized 3,000 people in one day? I mean, that's the Holy Spirit that can do this kind of crazy stuff. You see? So when we go, one baptism here, one baptism over there, it's definitely because the power of the Holy Spirit is not available to us. We're not doing it by His power. We're trying to do it by ourselves. Church is time to become not just a sold out discipline movement. It's time that we become the sold out spirit filled movement. Just like the first century church was. Point number two that's the secret of the stone becoming a mountain that's filling the whole earth. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit from the beginning to the end. Number two, Paul said, Yes, this gospel came to you not only with the power of the Holy Spirit, but with deep conviction. So when you're working with the Holy Spirit, you also need to build deep convictions. Because the Spirit is not going to do things for you. It's going to use you to do things. It's going to do things through you. You are a human vessel. So you must exemplify the convictions that the Holy Spirit can use. Deep convictions. So my second point is very simple. Grow deep convictions or run in vain. Are you fired up about that? See, Paul is very clear about here. If we don't have deep convictions about what Jesus taught us, there's no way we can win the world. There's no way the kingdom can reach all nations. You see, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, the Bible says, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor crowns except by competing according to the rules. And the rules over here are the convictions. There are some core convictions that the apostle exemplify that help them to evangelize the world in their generation. So it's important to understand that we have to fight according to the same rules. There's nothing new under the sun. We cannot invent new ways of doing ministry. They already did it before. And we just have to read and learn from those who are doing it so that we can all exemplify the same deep convictions that made the first century church grow in numbers. And let me tell you this, Paul saw himself as one of the expert builders in the first century. And he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that he built on the foundation with Christ. And nobody can build on a different foundation. And today we have leaders in our lives that exemplify the same qualities as Paul. I mean, when I see, look at Kip. Kip is the modern day Paul. For, 40, for, 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 for four decades, he's been preaching the gospel without stopping. And then we can see the convictions that Kip has been preaching 
from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, to the 2000s right now, he's saying the same thing all over again. And those convictions grew the church is so much under his leadership that today we will be full if we don't learn from keeping Elena McKean. So what are some of these convictions that I've learned myself? Because I had the privilege of joining the new movement in 2011. Of course, Keep was leading the former movement too. So some of these convictions are not new. Most of them are in the scriptures. And all of them actually have been practiced in the scriptures one way or another. So we're just doing what we have learned from the apostles. And we are learning from godly men. So I went to L.A., and that was my prayer to go in L.A. and learn directly from Kip's ministry. And uh, last year, when I went back to Abidjan after spending seven years in L.A., I could promise you I learned a few things that are helping us to have an impact in Africa right now. Number one, what did I learn? I learned that uh, you have to have a sold-out base. You need to build a sold-out base. At first, numbers are not important. Because if you don't build a sold-out base, you will never grow in number. Okay? And sometimes you, take a, you inherit a weak situation, and when you come in a weak situation, don't be afraid to really diagnose what's going on. Who's a disciple and who's not a disciple? You can have chicken and lions together living in the same stuff. It's not going to work. So you've got to make sure that you go down to a sold out base. Don't be afraid of counting people fall away if they're not there anymore. Anyway, if you don't count them, they're already gone. You don't want to live with ghosts. You want to make sure that those on your list are actually disciples that are committed to Christ. And of course, there's a place in the church for those who are weak. A weak person is somebody that wants to be helped. Okay? If they don't want to be helped, if they don't want our convictions, they don't want to live like disciples, let them go. It's better to have a sold out base, and that sold out base, I promise you, will grow. When we went to Abidjan, I just went after every single person in the church. I was coming out of COVID-19. I mean, it's been several months uh, before my departure, but it's been very hard for me coming out of uh, COVID-19 to really, really pour myself into making sure every single person is there on the list as a disciple. But I did it because I knew if I don't start there, I will end up coming back all the time. So that's why some people are leading the ministry that's a revolving, revolving door. You go to 50 and then you go back to 30, you go to 50, 30, because you don't have a sold out base. And I streamed the church down to 100 and 197 disciples. By the end of September, 197 disciples on the list were like two, 200 and something and 30 and 50. No, 197 disciples. I go, okay, that's what we got. And at least I could see everybody on Wednesday night. I could see them at Bible talks. I could see them on Sundays with guests. And then don't be afraid to start right there. A sold out base. And let me promise you, that sold out base in 10 months grew from 197 disciples to 358 disciples. Absolutely. About 161 growth in 10 months. That's not bad. See, you got to build a sold out base. Maybe you're going through that situation right now. Number two, what I learned in LA, I've learned that we're not baptizing churchgoers. We're not baptizing believers. We're baptizing disciples. That's actually what Matthew 28, 18 says. 18 to 19, uh, to 20. You got to make disciples of all nations, not church goers. So if you don't baptize workers, then you're going to add to the church people that are lukewarm, that have no intention of being committed to Christ. You don't want to build a fan club. You're building the church of soldiers of Christ. So make sure we study the Bible hardline with people and baptize only workers, not church goers. The last time I checked in my scriptures, every disciple should be a worker for Christ. You don't have a category that's working hard and another category that's just watching the game. No. Everybody should pour themselves out so that we can keep growing the kingdom all around the world. Number three, structure, order, and protocol. I mean, when you're leading a church and you're the only one doing everything, you have a problem. You have a problem if you're like Moses at the beginning of his ministry. <laughs> you're the one doing the singing. You're the one doing the prayer. You're the one doing the announcement. You're the one doing the leaders meeting. I mean, and you're always tired, exhausted, and you feel good about it. Like, wow, I'm pouring myself out. God look at you and go, you're insane. It's not supposed to work that way. There are many more people around you that God wants to use to expand you. Because there's only that much that one person can do. Moses learned the lessons from Jethro. He broke the ministry down into group of 10, group of 50, 100, 1,000, poor leaders, different categories. And guess what? He cranked. He survived. He lived up to 120 years. If you don't structure your ministry, I'm afraid you might be gone tomorrow. 
Not because God is calling you to go, but because you're just building like this. And without no structure, there's no way you could build something great. I mean, look at all the buildings around you. Nothing is accomplished in God's kingdom without order and organization. God is moving with order and organization in everything we do. So in Abidjan, I divided church in three super regions, in regions, in house churches, in zones, in Bible talk. A, a zone is actually a house church, okay? About 20 to 30 people. And then we do Bible talk expose, make sure everybody comes in front with their own Bible talk with a name and identity so that we, they can tell us what they want to do this year or the following two months. So we did all this, we, we named Bible Talks, we took great pictures so that every single Bible Talk can have an identity. And then we started with a new staff. I pulled so many young students in the staff and 80% of our staff are made of students right now. You see? And then guess what? Once you have a great structure, now you can build a strong campus ministry. Those are the deep conviction that I've learned, that the Thessalonians learned from Paul. Because Paul is the one that started the campus ministry. In the school of Tyrannus. You remember that in the physics? He started the school of Tyrannus and in a couple of years, he evangelized the entire province of Asia. So, a strong campus ministry. There's no other way. Because the campus is the fountain of leadership. That's where you're going to have the future leaders, the future evangelists and women ministry leaders. That's where you're going to have most people that are going to go to a mission team. I'm not neglecting the singles ministry. I'm not neglecting the marriage ministry. Actually, those two ministries are great also. We have to make sure that they're cranking. But you have to focus in the campus. You want to pull almost all your resources to build that campus. Because if you don't, then your dream and your vision to evangelize your area is just like a, you know, it's an illusion. There's no way it's going to happen. Okay? So, our campus, we focus so much imitating Raul in Sao Paulo, imitating Matt and Ellen over here in Miami. I mean, I was like blown away that Marcel and Tia could take a campus of a couple of disciples and turn that into a campus of 118 disciples. I was like, let me imitate that. And guess what? We went from 54 campus students in August to 106, stu uh, 106 students in, uh, in Abidjan Church right now as I'm talking to you. The campus is blowing up. And my goal by the end of this year is to have a campus of 250 disciples in Abidjan. Because I have 24 countries to evangelize in French-speaking Africa, where am I going to get the evangelists and women ministry leaders to go to Mauritania, to Madagascar, to Ile de la Réunion, to Senegal? Where are they going to come from? I'm not going to be going and knock on the other doors of other churches. Hey, bro, Matt, can you send me leaders? No, I'm going to grow them. And you have to do the same. If you don't grow your campus ministry, you cannot impact your world and your church. Are you fired up about that? The women ministry. It's not optional. I learned that also. Make sure that sisters are well represented. Raise powerful women in the church and in the campus. Train them to preach, to do communions, contributions, welcome, prayer together. We work together with the sisters. We don't leave the sister behind us. We're not matures. We're just like Jesus. We give them room to ex express themselves. And without the human, uh, woman touch in the church, the church is going to be filled with a bunch of arrogant people that have no sensitivity, no compassion for people. we got to have that size of the church. The sisters need to crank. So set the sisters free in your church. Let them preach. Of course, they're not leading the church, but they're walking alongside cranking brothers too. And then one other thing that we are learning and we've put it in practice is don't let your young disciples become idle. Make them make sure they come out of the water running. That's the new mantra that we got in Abidjan. Coming out of the waters running. I was praying about my retention rate. And I went, what is the problem, Lord? What is it that we're baptizing people and then they're going, you know, they're falling away the next couple of weeks or months? And I was like, wow, just like a revelation. Most of my young Christians are not doing anything. And actually, it's not their fault. I'm not expecting them to do anything. We're treating them just as baby. We expect them just to come to church. And then I saw these incredible scriptures about Paul in Acts chapter 9 from 19 to 22. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, when he got baptized, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. 
All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet so, so grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Paul was baptized, and the next couple of days, he's in Jerusalem preaching, convicting people. Where do you build a conviction to be able to prove that Jesus is the Messiah? By walking on the field from day one. And we made the decision in Abidjan. Every single prospect to be baptized needs to be ready to bear fruit in the next couple of weeks. So we make sure that they're in studies before they get baptized. I mean, if I'm going to teach you to be a fish of man, before I give you the certificate, I must make sure that you know how to fish. So put them in studies while they're studying the Bible. So that their first victory can happen so soon when they get baptized. So we expect that to happen. It's part of our staff. We have their names. We want to know who are the people they are studying with. And we make them great. And they are fired up about that. Let me give you a couple of examples. Mark Noah is a young brother that was baptized. He's a young student that was baptized in November last year. Guess what? With this new mantra coming out of the water running, Mark Noah has already been fruitful six times. Boris too was baptized in November. He's been fruitful seven times. And Boris now is our song leader. We expect them to be great. And Boris is a Bible talk leader. And he was baptized only in November last year. And then we have sisters like uh, 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 Kelly Grace. I mean, she's blowing it up over there. She was baptized in August last year. And she's already been fruitful six times. So you have, this is not just a couple of people, uh, you know, little specks in the church. I'm talking about, about 40, 50 solid young Christians that have already multiplied themselves two, three, four, five, six times. Actually, we have another one, Rachel, that was baptized in March, in April, actually, in April. She's already a grandma spiritually. She already baptized somebody who baptized somebody. Let me tell you this. When young Christians are busy doing the work, they're staying away from temptations. They're not going to fall away that easily. And then you have a new wave of people that are dreaming. You have a fountain of leadership. I mean, I think this is a secret. We have to fight hard and put all our young Christians in the battle of lost souls right there when they come out of the water. And guess what? Our retention rate went down to 70%. So we keep 70% of the people that we are baptizing. And we want to make more progress. We want to go to 100%. So no miss weekly D times. It's a conviction. By Friday, 10 p.m., every leader should report that they already discipled their people by Friday. So that you leave Friday, Saturday for those who are, you know, couldn't make it. And then on Saturday, you clear the ground. But at Sunday, everybody must have been disciple. And then you need to have a monthly zealous group. You got to have your new Christian orientation. You have to call your nationals to return to their homeland. Don't be coward. Turn them. Paul says in Romans chapter 9, the people of my race are feeling anguish in my heart. I wish I could be myself lost and cut from God so that I could save the people of Israel. Guess what? You have people like Andrew Smelly going to Africa. I mean, he's an American guy, even though in the kingdom there's no nationality. But we're coming from somewhere, from a background. Andrew shouldn't have more love for Africans than Africans themselves. And then we have a lot of people in different churches on, in the movement that are from Nigeria, from Cameroon, from Zimbabwe. And you don't want to go home? I mean, who's going to save your people, man? I mean, I want to go everywhere as much as I can. But don't you feel the calling of God to go home and then help your people to be saved, your parents, your loved one? We got to call our nationals to go home. We can force them, but we have to teach them. We have to show them the scriptures. We have to give them a passion for their home country. Those are some of the convictions I've learned. RCCM, we have the first French-speaking RCCM in the movement. We're just imitating everything we learn from L.A. And guess what? With all this conviction, prayer and fasting chain twice a year, we do it. 40 days divided by every single disciple speak one day, one day, one day, one day. And we pray and fast. Because without prayer and fasting, we cannot build the kingdom all over the world. With all this put in place, in the past nine months, I already told you, French Africa is blowing up. We started the year with 1,000 100 disciples. Now we are 1,332 disciples in French Africa. The church in Congo is doing the same thing. And it grew by 100 disciples in the past nine months. Because these convictions have been proven from the first century church and they actually work. What are you waiting for? Let's put that together. Let's start building the kingdom with D 
deep conviction and with the Holy Spirit. Lastly, you have to make the decision to imitate or you're going to be disqualified. This point is pretty simple. What I already said, we got to imitate the apostles. We got to imitate the leaders like Kip and Elena, leaders like Tim and uh, uh, Leanne Kernan and, you know, Michael Williamson in London. Michael has done a great job in London. When you see all the posts, all these actors being baptized, don't you want to imitate that fire from London? I mean, we want to imitate each other. I want to imitate Matt and Ellen. I want to imitate Andrew and Patrick. Whatever good they're doing in their ministry, Raul and Linda, let's pull that together. Only imitators are going to see the kingdom grow into all nations. If you're done, then you're trying to build your own kingdom. You want to have your personal style. But let me tell you that that's the independence that took Judas away. We can't be like that. We can't be little islands in the kingdom, having our own theory about ministry. We can only do what we've seen being done. Church is time. How did the rock become a mountain and fill the earth? Through three little convictions. They were led by the Holy Spirit from Jerusalem to Rome. And they did it with deep convictions. They did not invent it. And they were all imitators of each other. Paul was imitating. Peter was imitating. Timothy was imitating. Titus was imitating. Actually, Paul was calling them to imitate him as he imitated Christ. And when I talk about imitation, I'm not saying we should imitate the evil in people. We don't imitate sin in people. We don't imitate arrogance. We don't imitate, you know, self-sufficiency and lack of compassion. We only imitate the godly character that they exemplify. Because Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That means if you're not imitating Christ, you're not worth your being imitated. Church, those are the three convictions I've learned. Thank you so much for the chance that I have today to share my heart. French Africa is moving forward. By the grace of God, we went back home now. We've planted three churches uh, Bujumbura last year that has grown to 146 disciples. We planted Yaounde last month. Actually, I was away in Yaounde for three weeks without my family and my wife. And by the grace of God, 19 disciples planted the church and they baptized 19 people. And we got two more place membership from the ICOC. And then last week, we started Brazzaville in Congo. Church, we are fired up. And thank you so much for your contributions, for your financial sacrifice that's empowering us to go into all nations in French Africa, in our generation. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Wow. What an amazing start to this year's World Missions Jubilee. My name is Ricky Chalinor. This is my amazing Maganda wife, Colleen. And we bring you greetings and good news from Manila, the Philippines, and Southeast Asia. It's so encouraging to know that we see the miracles that God is doing in our own churches in front of us. But now I hope you understand that God's Spirit is working in all of the churches all throughout the world. It is encouraging to know that we are a part of a worldwide movement. I'm so encouraged by this general session that we just had. Thank you so much to the McKeans, the Kernans, and the whole LA Church for putting this amazing program together for all of our brothers and sisters in the movement for the World Missions Jubilee. The flag ceremony accompanied by all of the good news from our faithful world sector leaders gave us so much vision yes. for what God has been doing around the world. I'm so thankful to be a part of a worldwide movement that is truly powerfully moving. Thank you, Blaze, for your powerful lesson. I'm so inspired by how God is working miracles in French-speaking Africa. You and Patricia are heroes in the faith, and it is evident in your life. Thank you, Blaze, so much for a powerful and a prophetic lesson to inspire us for all that God can do in moving mountains. Brothers and sisters, I hope that we all understand that there is no other church like this on earth. We are truly building the book of Acts. We are building the first century church in the 21st century. That a little rock back then, it filled the whole earth. And God has chosen us for this day and this time so that we likewise in this time can fill the whole world with the true gospel of Jesus Christ in this generation. But to do that, let's make a decision to, to be that rock personally in our lives, in our homes. We fill our homes with the good news of God. We fill our neighborhoods, we fill our cities, our workplace, our campuses, our nations, so that in this generation we can say, the world was evangelized in our day. Again, 
What an amazing opening session for this year's World Missions Jubilee. Let's close out in a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we love you so much, God. And we know, Father, that your spirit yearns to work through our lives. We know that your spirit yearns to work through our Bible talks, that you want every nation, every city, every home to know the good news that your son came to this earth to die so that we could be his disciples, that our lives could be transformed. Father, I pray that today, right here, right now, that every one of us, we would make a decision to be the mountain movers Amen. in our homes, in our cities, everywhere we go, God. Through faith, we can move mountains, God. Father, thank you for everything you give us. Be with each and every disciple as they're watching and listening right now. We love you, God, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We pray to glorify you. Be with us. Be with this time. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.